Good evening. I'm reminded tonight of the story of the new pastor at a church and his first Sunday there, just one old farmer showed up. That was it. So he waited. Nobody came. Nobody came. Finally, he said to the farmer, he said, well, what do you think we ought to do? Farmer said, you know, if I go out to feed and only one cow comes in, I still feed her. So the preacher said, all right, here goes. And about two and a half hours later, he finished up and looked at the guy and said, what do you think? He said, well, I said if one cow comes in, I feed her, but I don't give her the whole load. <laughs> so, so tonight, you're going to get the whole load, all right? I said earlier I could preach maybe a couple extra hours tonight and they'd have the road clear and everybody could get home that way. But All right, we're going to be in the book of Philippians, chapter 2. Philippians, chapter 2. Now, remember, Paul has a special affinity for the church at, at Philippi. Uh, they were the first ones to come to his aid with finances and to help him in his ministry. And, and so when he speaks to them, he, he can be very, very plain about things when he, when he talks to them. And so he's going to be talking to them here, and we're going to share in that conversation his admonition or exhortation or encouragement to be like Christ. Now, I remember as a teenager, maybe 13 or 14, hearing the pastor preach on being like Christ and he kept saying that, you know, we need to be just like Christ. I've preached that. At the same time, I understand I am not Christ. I am not like Christ. There's so much difference between him and me. And that's what makes this, this, this ride such a, a thrilling ride because he gives us the opportunity day by day to strive to be more like him, to strive to be more like him. When I went to Eaton, Ohio, my freshman year, halfway through the year, I was too late to play basketball for the, for the high school there. I got to play baseball. But the next year, I went out for the basketball team. And, uh, you know, I was one of the new kids. And so I was number 12 on a 12-man team. In other words, I just skinned my way onto that team. But I worked hard. And so as the season progressed, I moved up a little bit to where instead of being the last guy that's going to get called to go in the game, now I'm up to uh, maybe number seven or eight. And then I got up to the possession of sixth man. And it happened because I worked hard and I learned all the plays from every position. So that if somebody came out of the game, I got to go in. I played center. I played forward. I played guard. And that, that was pretty exciting because I got to play almost as much as the starters because anybody that came in, I was going to be the guy going in there. And then we got to the last game of the season and the coach said, Rick, you've worked real hard this year, so you're going to be a starter. Now, I don't know if any of you played ball before, but when you make it to the starting lineup, you have arrived in sports. And I was so excited about that. Because on Saturday night, we're playing our final game, and I'm going to start at a guard position. 
and I broke my finger in practice the night before. And then I didn't tell him the whole truth. <laughs> so I did start. I couldn't, I couldn't hardly dribble, couldn't hardly do anything with that. But the key thing here is that it was a lot of hard work to get to that position where I wanted to be. Well, as a Christian, my one desire should be to be like Christ. That others could see me or see in me the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I realize that people aren't going to see him in me 100% of the time. It's just not going to happen because I'm still in the flesh. I have not been perfected in, in the idea that I have arrived. I have reached my destination. I'm going to reach that when I stand in his presence and the old devil and all his temptations is out of the way and I can have the mind of Christ fully and understand all things that's, that's coming, but it's not there yet. If I could have one prayer that God truly answered, and there are so many that I, I ask him, but one thing, it would be that I could be a right testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because so many things depend on that. And, and it's not just things about me. As a matter of fact, uh, while that's a, a great thing to have that closeness and that close walk, the, the greatest thing about having that testimony of being like Christ is the impact you can have on those around you. And that's where we need to have our desire. So as Paul is writing, he says to the church there, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you tonight for your love for us and your desire for us, and we ask you, Lord, to just look at us in the midst of our failures, and Lord, lift us and encourage us to keep stepping forward, to keep following your footsteps, to keep striving for that day when we will be like you. Lord, we pray tonight that as we study your word together, you'll open our hearts and our minds to receive it. And then as we receive it, Lord, that we will be... Uh, encouraged through it to strive for that achievement of being like you. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So he says there, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ. And uh, this morning I was speaking at our church and, and uh, uh, I, I was talking about funerals and the consolation that you, you just have it in your heart to console people. Now, I've done a lot of funerals over the years, and uh, I've never done one that was easy. I have done some that were very difficult because they were people that I was very close to. But when you have the knowledge that that person is a Christian, that they are in the presence of God. As we're doing the funeral and the old shells laying there in the casket or the memorial service where they're already buried or whatever, the, the knowledge that they are in the presence of God is such a comfort. It's such a consolation to know that we're talking about that person and about our love for them and we can we can share with those there that there's no way they'd want to come back once they've tasted what it's like to be in the very presence of God 
they would never want to come back. The consolation of Christ is that consolation of knowing that that we have him as our Savior and that no matter what, you can't change that. Nobody can take that out of our hand. Nobody can take us out of his hand. Nobody can change our eternal destination because we have Christ within us. So therefore, uh, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, Knowing that people care about you. Brother Ron expressed to me Friday while we were sitting there talking. He expressed to me how much it has meant to him to see the outpouring of love from his people. That knowledge that people care about you. When I was in the hospital back in 07, uh, it was, uh, it was touch and go. Three out of four doctors said I was not going to survive. I was going to die. The, the knowledge of people who were there to express their love. I remember Pastor Ron and Sister Jean being there to the hospital to see me. I don't remember a lot about it because <laughs> I, was, I was pretty out of it with the drugs and stuff that I was on in intensive care. But, but I do remember him sitting down here in the chair just off to the side of the bed. There are other people who have said, hey, do you remember when I came to the hospital to see you? And I go, nope. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't. But the love that they showed in being there for me was just the same whether I remember it or not. Knowing later that they did take the time and make the effort to be there to see me, that love just really what an encouragement it is to know. I remember because I was in intensive care, my grandkids couldn't come and see me. Cassie and Seth, there, there was outside the intensive care, there was a window and Cassie and Seth brought the kids so they could come to that window and see Papa inside, and I could wave to him. I remember going home from the hospital, and little Emma telling me that I take care of you now, Papa. <laughs> she was probably about four then. I take care of you now. And if I said, hey, could I get a drink? She would scream at anybody who jumped up, no, I'll get it. You know what that said? That was screaming, I love my papa. Man, what a comfort it is to know you're loved. What a comfort it was to know that Leah was there from the time they'd let her in till the time they threw her out. And every night she had to go home in the dark Just knowing and feeling that love. What a comfort. So if there be any consolation in Christ, if there be any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit. You know, that's one of the things that uh, over the last couple of months, doing a lot of fill-in up here, uh, there's a fellowship. Uh, many of you people, I, I, I think just about everybody here, except for maybe John, I don't think you've been to our house, John, but I think everybody else has been to our house. And that fellowship in the gospel, that fellowship in that, uh, that kindredness of spirit, the spirit of God indwelling you and indwelling me, that we have that fellowship that the world can't understand. They just can't. If there be any fellowship of the Spirit, 
if any bowels. Now, in, in Bible times, we, we today, everything we read about is the heart and as the seat of emotions. But then the bowels were the seat of emotion. I understand that. I understand how when you really care about somebody or something, uh, it can absolutely hit you right in the pit of the stomach. If something goes wrong or if something goes right, it can still hit you there. It's just like a, a, a sock in the stomach. And then it says, and mercies. And mercies. Knowing that we have not only our Heavenly Father, but we have our family, we have our own church family, and then we have the extended family, the family of God, all of us who are brothers and sisters in Christ, and the mercy that is shown to us by having that kind of a support system. It's just, it's just unbelievable what God has set in motion and in place for us. And so as Paul writes to them here, he said, if any of these things are true, if you're experiencing all of these things, and you do, if you're truly a born again Christian, then he says, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded. You know, in, at the time of Christ, the church beginnings with just the disciples, there, there was no time yet for schisms or for false teachings. Everybody was on the same page. Very quickly, Satan began to make changes there. I want to bring these people in, going to bring these people in. And the willingness of the church to receive people who want to profess Christ. And then some of them were there not, uh, not really to aid and to help, but to disrupt and pervert what was going on. He says, to uh, fulfill you my, my joy that you be like-minded. Today, all over the world, there were churches meeting. Some of those churches are just like this church here. They're going to be fundamental, Bible-believing, conservative Christians. Some of them aren't. Some of them are going to be teaching things that are totally contrary to what the Word of God says. Some of them today... We're teaching that your salvation was in your service to your church. That's where your salvation is. Some of them were teaching that your salvation was in your baptism into that church. Some of them were teaching today that your salvation is that at the end of everything, God's going to weigh in the balances and if your good outweighs your bad, then you get to come in. It's not scriptural. Not scriptural at all. There's one place in the scripture that says, you have been weighed in the balances and what? Found wanting. Yeah. The only time we hear of anybody being weighed in the balances, they didn't measure up. So it's not about us. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But then the last part of that verse sums up my entrance into heaven. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No other way. Acts 4.12, there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We were talking today and... Uh, uh, Lee and I, and she was saying, didn't we heard somebody reading from a different translation and must was might. 
whereby we might be saved. Not must be saved, but might. Boy, that puts a big change into that verse. So we see a lot of people teaching a lot of different things. Paul says, listen, you want to make me a happy man? Be like-minded. Stay with the truth. He goes on there and says, having the same love. That's the love that God has for us, we have for those around us. It's just, it's just amazing. We were with all the grandkids this week and had a great time. And uh, it never ceases to amaze me how you can have so much love in your heart. I, I saw a bumper sticker once that said, grandkids are God's reward for not killing your kids. So <laughs> Now see the way you're laughing, some of you are going, yeah, I can remember that. <laughs> I can remember wanting to pinch their head off, you know, just... Okay, we're just going to finish this today. But to have that kind of love for them. And while people can love their family and love their grandkids, how much more special is that when the love for you, that you have for them is the same love that God has for you? That wants everything to be the very best for them. A love that wants them to come to know Christ as Savior. That they too will be able to spend eternity in his presence. That's the kind of love that Paul is talking about. That you have the same love. Being of one accord. I told the story this morning of a guy that I went to college with. We finished at the same time and we were both from the same church and we were both going back to Ohio and Gary said, why don't we rent one of the big U-Hauls? We'll load my stuff first, put yours in the back. It'll be less money and uh, then we'll stop and unload you and I'll go on. I said, man, that sounds like a winner. Well, Gary had quite a bit more furniture than he thought he had. So we had to rent a trailer besides that to pull behind my vehicle. But the morning we were leaving Springfield, Missouri, I said to Gary, I said, now look, I've traveled this road a lot. I know the best places to get off. So we have to stay together because we were going to share some of the expense on the truck, you know, on the gas and stuff for that big truck. So I said, we have to stay together. Now I will follow you. So I can keep an eye, he was towing his car, I'll follow you so I can keep an eye on your car. And there's a place just before we get to St. Louis where it's easy to get off, we can get gas, there's a place there to eat, you know, several places. We can do this and so when we get close to that, I'm going to come around you and you'll know then that we're getting ready to get off. And he said, okay. He said, I need to stop at the apartment. His wife's sister was getting married, so she was staying in Springfield for an extra week. So I said, I'm, gonna go, I, I'm facing this way. I got to go up and turn around and I'll come back and we'll take off. When I came back, he was gone. So I went to the apartment. He wasn't there. No, he didn't come here. So now I'm out on the freeway. I gave Gary a walkie-talkie and said, we can talk back and forth because I have a CB. So keep this with you. So we got ready to leave and I said, where's your walkie-talkie? I packed it in the back. So I'm going up the freeway and I'm on the CB and I'm saying, hey, I'm looking for a U-Haul truck pulling a green Chevy. And this trucker comes back and said, yeah, just, just right up the road here. He's getting off on this exit. So he was getting off the freeway. I would have gone right by him. So I get off and I say, now, Gary, we got to stay together. You know, we got to have the same mind on this, you know. Got to stay together. Okay. So we take off. We get almost to St. Louis. And I go around him so I can show him where we can get off and get gas and everything. 
And as I'm out here going around him, he turns off that exit. Now, we laugh about that today, but I was not real happy with Gary at that moment. So I tell Leah, okay, we're going to get off up here. Let's get gas. Grab us something to go. And uh, then, then we'll catch Gary or find him. As we're sitting there, when she's waiting for food, there goes Gary by on the interstate. So I take off. We get through St. Louis. We're on the east side where 70 goes east. And we're coming up behind him as he drives by our exit, headed for Chicago. So I finally get him, get him turned around, and we get off, and I pull over, and I said, here's some money for gas. I'll see you in Ohio. <laughs> What's the matter? I said, Gary, you, you haven't done one thing like we agreed on. That's what God hates. That we come together and we have a plan and we have a decision based upon scripture and then you don't follow the plan. You go this way and this person goes that way. He says, you want to fulfill my joy? Be of one accord. By the way, Gary had loaded all his papers in the back of the truck for the truck rental. So he borrowed my papers because it showed how to hook his car up on the dolly. And then he kept them. I had a hard time turning the trailer in because I didn't have any paperwork on it. Oh, I was frustrated. Frustrated. And I'm thinking about that going, you know, God must sit up there going, what were they thinking? When we, when we can't get it together, when we can't all work together, when we can't be of one accord. Paul said, you want to make me happy? Be like-minded. Have the same love. Be of one accord, of one mind. This church is about to go through some changes. And it's important that as a church... You're all on the same page. That you all have the same desires and the same wants. Now, it's always difficult when you start searching for a new pastor. It's always difficult. For one thing, man, we're used to the old guy. Well, I guarantee you, your new pastor may be absolutely right down the line where he should be doctrinally and everything else. But he's not going to be Ron Carter. And that's going to be a difficult thing to get used to. And to take the time as a church to say, this is what we want. This is what we're looking for in a pastor. Now you have a search committee. And I've already told them this. You guys need to make sure you're all on the same page as you start looking for a new pastor. But I can hear God saying, as Paul said here, fulfill you my joy. Be like-minded. Have the same love. Be of one accord. That, that we're going to get through this thing and not harm the work here. As a matter of fact, the prayer is that that... Uh, the, the church through this time will be brought closer and that the uh, church will go forward from there. That, that's what you want. What, what's, the, what's the main result? It, over in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So, God has placed a great responsibility upon us. How are you going to handle that? Paul said, you want to make me happy? Keep that same love. Be of one accord, of one mind. Looking for uh, someone that will fit the bill here to be the pastor 
of this church that's going to be able to take this church forward from here. Now, we all wish that Brother Ron could pastor until he drops. And, and, you know, you love somebody and you care about somebody. My old home pastor, what was he, 86 when he, he finally retired? He was still pastoring at 86. But the fact is, he was in very good health at 86. But the fact is that when, when we start looking at the future, we want the future of this church to coincide with God's will for this church. And so we need to be praying for that. If you're not on the search committee, that does not limit you from praying for wisdom for those men to be looking at and selecting candidates that will be in in um, in line with what the word, what the church is looking for, what the church needs, and primarily, fundamentally, he's got to line up with the book. You can deal with with differences in personality, but you can't differ. You you can't deal with differences in what they believe about the book. So it's our job to take care of the ministering of the mysteries of God as a church, that, that we are stewards of those mysteries, that the world can't understand anything about how, uh, how faith works and how our hearts can be uh, knit together in one accord looking for God's will to be done, no matter what that will is. World can't understand that, but it doesn't lessen our responsibility to be that way. So when we come down to the end, we have one goal, and that goal is that we as a church, that you as a church, and our church too, because, you know, but, but that the church would be of one mind, of one accord, looking for and expecting God's will to be done in the selection process. That, that it's, it's that one of those things that, that we have to come down and say, you know what? We all share that same love. We all share the same bond through the Spirit of God. And we need to share the same desire for this church. What's the purpose of the church being here? The purpose of us being here is to produce fruit. And so, as you're looking toward that future, keep that in mind. It, it's by your like-mindedness, by your single accord, by your singleness of heart, that others are going to be drawn to Christ through this church. The pastor is the icing on the cake, is the one who can expound it and deliver it and show it to people, but they're going to need to see in this church that there's a unity here, that we're all in this together and we all want the same thing. I hope you don't take this as me lecturing you. I am not. Uh, Remember when I said up there about the fellowship of the Spirit? And we have that fellowship between our church and your church, between Brother Ron and our people, between me and his people. We have that fellowship. And so just as he would want the same thing for our church to be like-minded of one accord, I have that same desire for this church to be like-minded of one accord, especially at a critical time like this, because we have the opportunity to show the world what it really means to be a Christian. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. 
We thank you that through your word, Lord, you instruct us, you encourage us, you uplift us, and sometimes you chastise us. Lord, we pray that we would have open hearts and minds to receive your word and what you have for us. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be in the driver's seat for each and every member of this church during this crucial time. Lord, I pray that you would deliver this church with a pastor that would be ready to take them uh, forward. And Lord, that this church would uh, prosper, not monetarily, but in the number of souls that come to know Christ because of this church being here. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, encourage your people. And tonight, Lord, we pray that as we look at our own role, that you would be uh, speaking to our hearts. If there's things that, that we need to get cleared out of our own lives before we start this process, Lord, help us to make that choice tonight. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, won't you please stand? We're going to sing out of the old book, Have I Done My Best for Jesus? <clears throat> I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? Who died upon the cruel tree? To think of his great sacrifice at Calvary, I know my Lord expects the best from me. How many of the lost that I have lifted, how many are the chained I've helped to free, I wonder have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me. Sing one more verse. The hours that I have wasted are so many. The hours I've spent for Christ so few. Because of all my lack of love for Jesus, I wonder if his heart is breaking too. How many are the lost that I have lived? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me?